Amen. I'm switching from this mic. The Pharaoh of Egypt is a prime example of man's stubborn, sinful, and shamelessly proud nature. He is a picture of worldly greatness, wealth, and power. Ancient Egypt was the envy of the world and one of history's greatest empires, with the Pharaoh standing at the pinnacle of human achievement. And in all of the pomp and circumstance, this untold wealth and power, the position of unquestioned authority, man fancies himself invincible, unlimited, and even godlike. For thousands of years, mankind has had the opportunity to learn from history. But do you think we would? Somehow we just can't garner the wisdom. But we think we can build some kind of utopia upon the achievements of the past. But what has mankind done? He's managed to build better things. Managed to make a better life. His life a somewhat better experience. He's developed technology and medicine to extend and enhance his existence. However, he still cannot control the weather. He cannot stop the night from coming. And he certainly can't stop the snow from falling. He has changed his wardrobe and his hairstyles, his transportation and his communication, but he's never changed his own nature. Indeed, man can no more change his nature than the leopard can change his spots. Man's proud, stubborn, and rebellious nature is showcased in Pharaoh and continues to be demonstrated throughout mankind's history unto this day. We seem to have arrived at a time in history when men like Pharaoh have no need of God, refuse to see God in their history or in their present or in their future. God in many places has become a myth a bedtime story, an imagination of the lesser developed, or maybe even a cartoon character. And men raise their voice with the faint echo of Pharaoh saying, Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? Well, number one, He is the true and the living Creator God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1. I want you to look with me at verse 1. In case you have forgotten, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. Go over chapter 1 to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all of the host of them. So God created, amen? amen. I want you to notice in chapter 1 of Genesis, look at verse 16 and 17. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser night to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Go down to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created us. He created the stars and the moon and the, all the galaxies. He created the earth. He created all the animals. He created all the earth, vegetation. He created all the fowl, the air, the fish and the sea. But he also created you. He created us. He created mankind. In Psalm 100 and verse 3, the Bible says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. But the way mankind thinks today, you'd, you'd almost postulate that they think they have created themselves. Man conveniently forgets this vital fact or ignores it in favor of evolution. 
Now let's jump over to John chapter 1, if you would, please. Let's take a quantum leap, if you will, over to John chapter 1. I want you to look with me in verse 1. The Bible said in Genesis 1, 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now we go to John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you understand who this writer's talking about in John chapter 1? Right. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis, we have the Creator God, and in John, we have the Creator God. But in John, he is identified as the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's witnessed to by John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. There's only one God. Amen. Actually, by definition, there can only be one true God. The very title, the very word itself precludes all others. God. God identified himself in Exodus chapter 3. He said this, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you sent me unto you. I am. When God was asked what his name was, he said, my name is I am. You know what that means? The eternal, eternally existent one. So we find that the true and living God is known in the Old Testament as the Lord Jehovah. And in the New Testament as the Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas witnessed of him in John chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Do you know that Jesus identifies himself as I am in John chapter 8 when he said this? Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So that Moses said to God, who should I say sent me? And he said, tell them I am has sent you. And then the, they say to Jesus, you're not even 50 years old. He said, hey, you guys don't understand. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Amen. Jesus said he was the eternally existent one. That makes him the God of Genesis chapter 1, and it makes him the God of John chapter 1. Amen. As the creator God, the Lord Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord of all that he has created. Amen. The galaxies move at his command, not ours. The seasons change at his command, not ours. And life and death are not in our control, but his. Who is the Lord that you should obey him? I'll tell you who he is. He's the true and living creator God. You know, we are actually very, very puny in the scheme of things. In the space of the vastness of the universe, we are very puny. In the timeless line of eternity, what is man? Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Well, he's about to find out, isn't he? He's about to find out as God dismantles Pharaoh's kingdom and turns the ruling monarch into a whining child. He huffed and he puffed, but his house got blown down. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I bet he wished he had never said that. Who is the Lord that you should obey his voice? He's the one that gave you life. Do you understand you breathe his air? 
You eat his food. You walk on his planet. You explore his space. You enjoy his benefits. Listen, dear human being. You are totally and completely dependent upon God. Amen. You say, I don't even know God. But he knows you. You don't have to believe in God to make God be. Because he be. And how can you obey his voice then? I'll tell you how you obey the voice of God, by obeying his written word, the Bible. Amen. You see, this book is the written copy of the words which were breathed by God himself. Follow with me, if you will. If an earthly king decides to make an edict or a proclamation, he does not travel to every little hamlet and every little burg and speak to every single citizen individually to give his proclamation. You know what he does? He breathes his proclamation. His proclamation is written down, and that written down word is exactly have the same authority and power as if he had gone to every person and breathed in their own ear. You understand? Yeah, you try to do that with the government. Well, I don't have to obey that law. It's just written on paper. Yeah, try it. See what happens. Say, I don't have to obey the Bible. You know what? No, you don't have to obey the law of land either, but you've got to deal with the consequences. And you don't have to obey the Bible, but you've got to deal with the consequences someday. God's word is the same. It carries his authority because it came from him. To obey the Bible is to obey God, and not to obey the Bible is to disobey God. Your choice. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Number two, he's the one with whom you have to do. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, he's the one with whom we have to do. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Now let me just say this as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 4. If the Bible isn't the Bible, if it's not the, the breathed word of God, if it's not an animal, infallible, and inspired, and immutable, and reserved, if it's not, then why bother with it? If it's not, it's not it has no more authority than the Reader's Digest. If this isn't the word of God, what are we doing here? Why don't we just save ourselves a lot of trouble, a lot of money, close up shop, and go live like we want to live and do whatever we want to do? Because if this ain't the word of God, why are we fussing with it? But it is the word of God. Amen. And those of you that know Christ as your Savior, you know it's the word of God. Yeah. Because you've not only read it, you've experienced it. Amen. Amen. He is the true and living creator God. But number two, he is the one with whom we have to do. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That word quick in verse 12, talking about the word of God, is the Greek word, zao, it means to live. It means alive. The Bible is a unique book among all books on earth. The Bible is not just a book, it's a living book. Hey, I don't understand it. I just know it's true. It is alive, it's powerful. It changes lives. It changes destinies. It changes nations. Amen. Verse 13 very clearly states that one day every individual will give an account before God. Look what it says here. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I remember the first time I read that verse, it kind of went, woo. That verse is a powerful verse. I always think of that phrase, him with whom we have to do. 
You're going to deal with God, or should I say God's going to deal with you sooner or later. And you can't escape it. You know the old saying, you can run, but you can't hide. Because all things are naked and opened unto him, under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. His eyes search out the whole earth. They see behind every curtain. They see in the darkest corners. His eyes see everything as if it's in the noon light. His eyes can penetrate into the deepest recesses of the human heart and soul. His eyes peer into the back parts of your brain and know every thought afar off. That's who you have to do with. God is the judge of all the earth, the Bible says. Listen, not only is he the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but he's the judge of judges. All those who set themselves up on earth as judges, whether the judges of antiquity or the judges of the present day Supreme Court, they will all stand one day before the bar of God. John in the Revelation wrote this, I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. Who is the Lord that you should obey his voice? I'll tell you who he is. He's the one with whom you have to do. And I want you to notice, as I've already stated, that the Bible says here that all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That means he knows. He knows. You don't think anybody knows? He knows. He knows everything. That's one of his attributes. We learned it in Sunday school. He's omniscient. He knows everything. There's nothing about you that he has to discover. There's nothing about your life that he has to find out. He never says, oh, look at that. Because he knows. And he knows everything. You know, there are two great judgments coming in the Bible. The one is called the great white throne judgment. And the second one is called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the great white throne judgment is where all those who, like Pharaoh, knew not the Lord... All those who never trusted Christ as their Savior, they're going to meet God at the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says he's going to open up a special book, and it's called the book of life, and their name will not be found written in the book of life because they never trusted the Lord of life to give them eternal life. And the Bible says they'll all be cast into the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. That's found in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, and chapter 21, verse 8. But then there's the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, all those who are saved, those who have trusted Christ, those who have been born again, those who are the children of God, they are going to meet him at the judgment seat of Christ. Not to be judged as to whether they have eternal life or not, because God, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Their lives will be judged for one thing, to receive rewards or lose rewards. And from that judgment, all those people go off on to the glories of heaven. So, great white throne judgment, all the sinners will appear, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth righteousness, no, not one. So here we have all the great white throne judgment, all the people who did not have Christ as Savior appear there, and they all go from there to the eternal lake of fire. We have the judgment seat of Christ. All those who are born again and saved by the blood of Christ will meet him there. Their lives will be looked at to see how they were profitable for him. And uh, they'll get reward and lose reward and they all go to heaven. He's the one who's going to judge the world by bringing upon it a time of trouble like has never been nor will ever be. It's called the tribulation period. He's, he's the one who's going to destroy the planet by fire according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. That's who you have to do with. Right. You have to do with the one who can go like this and dissolve the elements. They'll melt, the Bible says, with a fervent heat. You see, it's not just this is going to melt. No, no, no. The elements are going to melt. The very Basic building blocks that make everything we know are going to melt. That's who you have to do with. 
We're told in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and fear him, or fear not them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Pharaoh and every other world leader in history, past, present, or future, is a pipsqueak, a Lilliputian compared to God. Who is the Lord that you should obey his voice? He's the one before whom every knee shall bow. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, Isaiah uh, says that God says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That's what God said. Jehovah of the Old Testament said that every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall swear. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You get it? In the Old Testament, Jehovah said every knee is going to bow to me. In the New Testament, Every atheist, every Muslim, every deist, every Wiccan, every Buddhist, every human being will bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is God. It says here, it's, it says here that they'll confess he's Lord. What do you, who do you think the Lord is? You see, you got the same Lord in the New Testament as you got in the Old Testament. Look in, look in your Bible, you'll see the word Lord with a capital L in the Old Testament. Then you go over to the New Testament, you see the, Lord, the word Lord with a capital L. It's the same Lord. There's only one Lord. The Bible says there's only one Lord. Amen. Well, you can't have one Lord in the Old Testament, a different Lord in the New Testament. No, no, no. The old Lord in the Old Testament is the same Lord in the New Testament. Amen. God the Father will be glorified when all creatures know and confess that the Son is God. With the Father. Who is the Lord that you should obey his voice? Number one, he's the true and living creator God. Number two, he's the one with whom you have to do. And then number three, he's the savior of the world. Look with me in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. He is the savior of the world. 1 John 4, 14. John, writing, of course, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who is the Lord that you should obey his voice? He's the one who loves you so much. That he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God to pay for your sins. He's the one who came from heaven to earth. Who walked a sin-cursed cesspool of a planet. Without sin himself. But willing to bear our sins. Willing, as the scripture says, to become sin for us. Why? Why? Because he loved us. Amen. You understand when Jesus died on the cross, listen to me. It wasn't just for somebody else. It was for your sins. Amen. He bare your sins in his own body on the tree, the Bible says. He's the savior of the world. He came. The Apostle Paul said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he added a postscript, of whom I am chief. The same God who crushes his enemies lifts up his friends. The same God who destroys his enemies will save his friends. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Art not thou our God who who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? God crushed his enemies, but he blessed Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was his friend. 
What made Abraham his friend? He believed God. James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. In Exodus 33, 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Wow. And then in John 15, 15, Jesus said, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. See what I'm saying? He's the Savior of the world. But he will destroy his enemies. But he'll lift up his friends. Amen. He will crush his enemies. But he will save his friends. Pharaoh said, I know not the Lord. And that was a sad truth. You know, there are those who do not know the Lord out of ignorance. And there are those who do not know the Lord out of arrogance. Which is it with you if you do not know the Lord? Is it because you didn't know or because you don't want to know? Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That includes you. For all of sin come short of the glory of God. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Hey, I get sick and tired of hearing people tell me they're going to heaven because they got baptized. I get sick and tired of people telling me they're going to heaven because they go to church. I get sick and tired of people telling me they're going to heaven because they're good people. They do good things. Their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds. If all that's true, then why did Jesus have to come from heaven and die on a cross and shed his blood and be buried and, die and rise again? Look, if, if not all that other stuff was true, God would have just said, hey, do that. That'll be good enough. That's right. God said you're all a bunch of sinners. You can't save yourselves. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Amen. God said I'm going to have to get down there myself. Yeah. i got to get down there myself. i got to pay for their sin myself. Amen. And he did. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Amen. He's the savior of the world. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. How should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? John 1, 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, you must come to know the Lord, not just know about Him. There's a difference. 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I want you to look with me at verse 21. And pay real close attention. Because Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's the will of the Father in heaven? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Haven't we been great? We've been very zealous for you, God. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You say, well, I thought God knew everything. How can he say he didn't know them? He didn't know them as his. You know what the Bible says? In, in, in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So God's looking in here today. And he's seen every person in every pew. And he knows exactly which ones are his. He knows you as his child. Amen. He knows himself as your father. Then he goes to someone maybe sitting next to you and says, I don't know him. 
I don't know her. I know about her. I know everything there is to know about her. I know everything there is to know about her. I'm God. But I don't know her as my child. I don't know him as my son. Sad, isn't it? You know, God wanted to save Pharaoh. Do you know that God would have taken Pharaoh to heaven if, God, if Pharaoh would have bowed his knee? Amen. If he'd have bowed his knee to the God of heaven and said to Moses, your God is the only true and living God. I fear your God, and I bow to your God. God would have seen that, and he would have imputed it unto him for righteousness, just like he did to Abraham, and just like he did to Moses. To know God personally is to be known of God. Do you? Are you? And if you do, and if you are, what then? And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to just have a couple minutes now to ask you some questions. I want you to answer these in your own heart, your own mind. This isn't between anybody but you and your own conscience, your own heart. You're here today and you're a Christian. You're born again. You're saved, you know it, and you're sure of it. I want you to lift your hand up just as a testimony. Yes, I am saved, I know it, and I'm sure of it. Okay, you can put them down, thank you. What iniquity is it that you need to depart from? Ye that name the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. What is it in your life that the Lord Jesus isn't happy with? What iniquity? Do you need to depart from? Yes, you're saved, but are you living like the new creature of 2 Corinthians 5.17 that you're supposed to be? Or are you like Demas who forsook the Apostle Paul and the ministry of Christ having loved this present world? Do you expect God's best while giving him your least? Have you forgotten who God is? Have you neglected your responsibility as his child? Are you living for yourself? Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Where is God in your Christian life? Christian, do you obey his voice? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been saved. Maybe you're watching right now and you've never been saved. God wants you to obey his voice by getting saved. He does not want you to die and spend eternity in hell. That's why he sacrificed the Son of God on Calvary's cross. That's why he bore your sins in his own body. That's why he paid for your sins with his own blood. That's why he died in your place and was buried in your tomb. And he rose again with power and authority to offer you the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. First Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1.8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to change your mind. Quit trusting in anyone or anything else. And just put your faith in Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you ready to obey the, to obey the gospel? Are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to forgive your sins and save your soul? Are you willing to do it right now, right here, right where you sit? We can pray together and you can pray in your heart and you can trust Jesus as your savior right where you sit. He'll give you the free gift of eternal life if you'll accept it. You say, preacher, I'd like to do that. Help me. I want you to look up at me. If you're gonna pray that prayer and trust Christ as your savior right now, I want you to look up at me and we'll pray together, just you and me. You'd like to know Christ as your Savior and be saved today? You'd like to pray and ask him into your heart? All right. Hold on one second. Anybody else? I'm looking around. Don't look back down until I see you. I know you want to pray with me. You want to trust Christ as your Savior. Anyone else? The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what the day may bring forth. This may be the last opportunity in life you ever have. So receive Christ as your Savior. Don't let it go. Anybody else? 
All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray, and I want you to say something like this to God. It's not a magic prayer. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So if you mean what we pray in your heart, God sees that as faith. All right, he'll forgive your sins and save your soul. Let's pray this prayer right now. You bow your head and you pray to God. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I cannot save myself. But I believe Jesus died for me, shed his blood to pay for my sins, and rose again from the dead. And I now ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive my sins and save my soul. Come into my heart and life as my Savior. I trust only in you. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. If you meant that, if you prayed that prayer in a minute, would you look up? On the authority of God's word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you call upon the name of the Lord? Then are you saved? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus? Are you saved? He said so. He cannot lie. But the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. Did you receive Christ as your Savior? Are you a child of God? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, for the great gospel of Christ. Paul said, it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Thank you for this person who's received Christ as Savior. Thank you for those who have come this morning. Now bless our invitation, my Father, as we think about what we've heard. Perhaps there's some Christians that need to come and say, Lord, sometimes I forget just how great you are. Lord, sometimes we come and say, Lord, here's the iniquity I need to turn from. Or maybe it's something else they need to pray about, but Father, may your people come. Father, may you guide and direct in the invitation as only you can. We'll give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.